Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Larry Stevens. I'm the Curator of Biology at the Museum. And today our topic will be the natural history and puzzling biogeography of Grand Canyon century plants in the family Asparagaceae and the genus Agave. I will often refer to them as agaves rather than century plants, uh, just because. So um, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Wendy Hodgson of the Desert Botanical Garden for, for helping us put together the show. Many of uh, the pictures you'll see of agaves here are from, uh, from her files. For those that are not Canyon literati, I have to keep going back through some of the history of the Museum of Northern Arizona and its role in understanding and, and even managing Grand Canyon National Park. The uh, park, of course, is, is a, a national park uh, function with its own staff, but the Museum of Northern Arizona for the past nearly 80 years has been, 90 years perhaps, has been uh, contributing to knowledge about the park. Walter B. McDougall was one of the first individual, uh, individuals to actually understand the distribution of agaves, agaves in, in Grand Canyon. Eddie McKee, a who later became a geologist, was actually a, a ranger naturalist at Grand Canyon and put together the, some of the first species lists there. Our own Stephen Carruthers, uh, who occupied the curator of biology position here back in the 1970s and, and helped bring me actually to Grand Canyon, uh, just tremendous naturalist and uh, really a, an authority on, on so much of uh, the, not only the, the biology of Grand Canyon, but also the management of it. He, he had many uh, successes in his career working with Grand Canyon. And so we're, we're continuing that, uh, the, the pursuit of knowledge of Grand Canyon through M&A. For those of you not familiar with what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, this large canyon feature that's about halfway through the overall course of the Colorado River. It's a 1400 mile course of the river that uh, extends from Wyoming and Colorado down to the Gulf of California. And Grand Canyon sits about in the middle of it. So uh, we're about halfway through that river's course with an, er uh, an area of about 2000 square miles and uh, a length of 280 miles. So it's a long stretch of river one of the longest protected stretches of river in, actually in the nation. Uh, the volume of the canyon, pretty incomprehensibly vast, 750 cubic kilometers. And it's a, it's a uh, kind of wonderfully large deep canyon, the ecology of which is still being explored. Its position in, in this uh, landscape is at the juncture of the Colorado Plateau and the Mugion Rim with the uh, Basin and Range Geologic Province to the south. So it's a, it's a mega ecotone, really a macro ecotone in which the transition from these two vast geologic provinces mix. Uh, so it's a crossroads, a crossroads of ecosystem through evolutionary space and time. For biomes, two geologic provinces, and uh, nearly three and a half kilometers of elevation range with, from the bottom of Lake Mead to the top of the San Francisco peaks, all of which falls into the drainage of Grand Canyon. It's a landscape with about 2,500 plant species, uh, more than 500 vertebrate species, and many more than probably 20,000 uh, invertebrates, and, and uh, in including many, many insect species. So it's a really vast, complex landscape. Now, until George Billingsley and Haiti Hampton in 1999 put the, the rim map together, we didn't really understand why we had such differences in vegetation from the Western Canyon to the Eastern Canyon. Their map showed us that we have a, a very narrow reach right in the middle of the canyon, the Moab Gorge, that separates this rather isolated Eastern Basin from the relatively open Western Basin that connects to the Southern Deserts. And so um, once this map became apparent, uh, was, was made, then it became apparent why we have so many unique species in this highly isolated eastern basin of the, of the landscape feature and relatively fewer of, of them in the, in the far west. In previous talks, I've talked about how that uh, stretch of river and the, the canyon around it functions as, as a corridor for the uh, genetic dispersal of organisms upstream and downstream, as a barrier and a filter, both across the, across the canyon and from upstream downstream directions. And it supports refugia, caves, springs, et cetera, other aspect related features of the canyon that, that uh, pro provide refuge for various populations. So this function will become uh, important to us later in the, in the talk, but I just wanted to remind you about it. Today, we're gonna focus on something called century plants. <clears throat> and we'll, uh, the, these are uh, again, uh, 
species in the family Faragaceae, genus Agave. <clears throat> they were studied, have been studied very intensively by first by Howard S. Gentry, uh, and then uh, in modern times by, by Wendy Hodgson. <clears throat> Wendy is a botanist at the Desert Botanical Garden and a can in a aficionado. And from their studies and, and from some of the work I've done on the plant, we'll look at taxonomy, morphology, the physiology of the plant, its autocology or life cycle, the biogeography, and some of the human issues and conservation related topics of this plant. Now we call it century plants, but in fact, most of them probably don't live a hundred years. We have plants, many plants in Grand Canyon that live more than a century. Bob Webb and, and some of his colleagues at the, in Tucson at the US Geological Survey have identified uh, two dozen plants that, are, that live for more than a hundred years, including plants like, like Mormon tea, for example, ephedra, which may well live uh, quite a few centuries, 500 years or more. Uh, there's a, a C14 date on a living uh, uh, mesquite tree along the river there <clears throat> that is about 900 years old. So uh, we, have, we have plants that may be uh, in Grand Canyon that may be approaching 100 years. Century plants are named century plants because they might live as long as a human lifespan, but um, they're, um, they apparently are long lived, I guess. Not really, uh, probably ever living this century or, or more. All right, so let's look a little bit at their, at their taxonomy. <clears throat> the family Asparagaceae. Uh, contains this family. This is a family named by Linnaeus, who might have liked asparagus. I'm not sure. It's a, a fam uh, This family of plants has many, many species in it. <clears throat> uh, these are green plants. They're these are land plants, although not all the fewer de plantae are, are land uh, land dwelling necessarily. They're vascular. They uh, they produce seeds, so they're in the uh, spermatophyta related to uh, to the in, into the class of Magnolopsida in the superorder of lilies, which are, is a kind of a shorthand for the monocots, all those kinds of plants that send up only a single leaf when they germinate. So think corn, palm trees, grass, orchids, etc. The order that family of agaves is in is asparagales, the family of asparagaceae, and there are about 44 genera in that family, including of course asparagus, but, uh, but many, many other genera as well. <laughs> So it's a, uh, their, their lineage is quite vast. For the agave overall, I think I counted 33 species in this list and three hybrid taxa. Many of these uh, individual species have multiple varieties, of course. In uh, we'll be looking today at a couple of the agaves that live in Grand Canyon. Agave utahensis, for example, has four subspecies all of which have been reported in or around Grand Canyon, but some of them are more uh, related to, the, to Nevada. The Ebora spina, for example, is a, is a Nevada uh, subspecies, Las Vegas and to the, and to the west and north. <clears throat> so, um, but we'll be spending a fair amount of time talking about agave utahensis, and then we'll get to some of the other species in the list here as well. So it's a pretty big genus, you know, this is a, quite a diverse group of plants. We'll first look at Agave Utahensis variety Kaibabensis. So this is the Kaibab Utah century plant, or we'll call it the Kaibab Agave. Um, it's described uh, through all the text you can see there. One of the uh, important features uh, of the plant though is that thorns are kind of widely spaced. They're downhooked thorns. Downhooked means they're not uh, protecting themselves from things that are coming in from the top to eat this plant for reasons we'll talk about in a little bit, but probably more to prevent rodents from jumping up on it and, uh, and trying to um, uh, eat through it. It's a very spiny plant, uh, very dangerous if you're walking around them and uh, uh, pretty widely found across the, across the Eastern Grand Canyon region. Let's look at that range a little bit. We can see that, so it's found at kind of some higher elevation off to the west, but really the bulk of the population is in the Eastern Basin of Grand Canyon. This really should probably be considered to be a Grand Canyon endemic, I, I, I suppose. Uh, at least this portion of the Colorado River, it's, uh, it's endemic to this, this reach. Very common along the river on all the desert slopes. As I said, it's got these sharp hooked thorns along the edges that uh, point downward. And those thorns, th thorns are uh, inch or inch and a half apart or so. Uh, 
so it's a very distinctive plant. You see it, and and right off the bat, you know by the thorns that it's a that it's a uh, uh, something you don't want to mess with too much. One, of the, you know, among the many characteristics of this plant, one of the most fascinating stories is that it lives uh, for some period of time and then sends up a flowering stalk in a matter of just a couple of weeks, maybe even just ten days. Uh, it can send up an enormous flowering stalk, and the flowers are pretty gorgeously arrayed in clusters on the on the stem. These are produced in the springtime. There's an elevational story there, and the plants that are growing along the river bloom much earlier than those up, up high, perhaps two months or so difference in flowering time, time across elevation. And that's of course important uh, in terms of pollinator, uh, the pollinator story. So the plant produces the inflorescence rel relatively quickly. Uh, it flowers in great abundance. And um, once pollinated, uh, produces uh, pods and with viable and inviable seeds in the pods. You can see the black seeds there are the viable ones. They're flat, uh, they're about uh, four millimeters long or so. White, the white seeds are inviable seeds, typically hundreds of them in each of the pods. Uh, of course, not all of them are viable, but um, they shake down and fall to the ground. They're not really transported by animal life as far as anybody really uh, can know. Uh, they fall into cracks and crevices, and that means that the plants in a, in a given area are related to each other. So this is the, the you know, the, the kaibab agave. It's, a, it's really got a pretty remarkable aspect and life history to it. Then we have another variety in this supposed same species. So this is agave utahensis, variety utahensis. And what's distinctive about this one is the, the spines are closer together. You can tell them that way. They're, they're often uh, much thinner than, than the leaves of the, of the kaibab agave. And the leaves are quite a bit shorter. So this, uh, this variety lives in the Western Canyon. And uh, the, the kind of fascinating thing about it is you can see that it's not just one rosette. It's multiple rosettes. And I've seen, ros uh, seen fairy rings of this meaning multiple rosettes that are in a circle, they're all connected. Thousands of rosettes can exist in, uh, in, in this variety of the, of the Utah century plant. So same species of plant, supposedly, but it's a very, very different uh, growth form, having these what we call pups or, or, uh, or rosettes. This species is found, you know, perhaps broadly across the region, but not so much in the Eastern Canyon, pretty commonly in the, and it becomes the dominant form in the Western Canyon. It's also uh, kind of got a broader range than the, than the Kaibab form. So a bit less, uh, less of an endemic to the, to the Colorado River Canyon. All right, so we've been talking about the structure of the plant, the, the morphology of the plant. Agaves are very well defended. <clears throat> this is a plant that has very sharp leaf tips and spines. There are horror stories about um, people falling on these things. Uh, the leaf tips and spines contain a substance called calcium oxalate raphides. And these are tiny, very sharp crystals. <clears throat> and when they, uh, if you were to jab yourself uh, on these, I've been stabbed in the arm and the leg and everywhere else, <clears throat> it's really quite painful. The sap is also highly toxic and sometimes act, uh, elicits a strong allergic reaction. The sap contains saponins, and these are um, basically soap molecules. So uh, that's uh, uh, very distasteful, it horribly, just, I don't recommend tasting this at all. It tastes worse than yucca even. And if you do happen to bump up against it, you'll, you'll never, never forget it and, and rue the day that you did. One time I was in Grand Canyon, down in the uh, Lower Canyon, and trying to check out a population of an, another, another endemic plant down there, one called McDougal's flavaria. It only blooms in October. So I was on an October trip. It had been raining. I was running up a very skinny trail up a very narrow canyon, Matt Catamiba Canyon, and uh, did my observations on the plant, trying to figure out what the pollinators were on it, and came running down that trail, and it tripped and fell headlong down the slope. And this is a canyon that's quite steep and narrow, and <clears throat> the talus slope I was running on ended in about a 50-foot drop on a, on a bare rock. I swung my arm out as I was sailing down this slope towards the edge of the canyon, swung my arm out and wrapped around an agave and hung there over the edge of the cliff and then brought myself back up to my feet and um, unstabbed myself from the agave and, and realized that um, you know, <clears throat> only a moron runs with boots in Grand Canyon 
on a rainy day. Ended up um, surviving that, but for no good reason. So, um, but I well remember the the pain of the of the agave stabbing me so my in uh, me in the arm, and those oxalate crystals really are quite painful. So I don't recommend getting stung by this this plant. Okay, so we've got some very rigorous, rigorous self-defense on the part of the plant. It's very well defended, not attacked uh, by anything that tries to eat it outwardly. However, it's pollinated by, uh, by a very interesting suite of, of, uh, of species. Oftentimes uh, in the spring months, so beginning in April uh, and extending into May, you'll find a flowering agave with a giant carpenter bee hovering around it, guarding its territory ferociously from any other big carpenter bee. She buzzes very loud and, and uh, really maintains her, her territory around that, uh, that agave, flowering agave very rigorously. It's probably also how she attracts males because the males also tra attracted to the plants and um, she can mate there and, and uh, she may use the, the agave as a, as a roosting uh, point, but she's trying to guard, guard her resource. As she's you know, big and nobly defending this, this rather large inflorescence, there might be tens of thousands of tiny, uh, tiny Hulictine and, uh, and apid bees that are actually taking most of the nectar from her. They're too small really for her to pay attention to, but they're incredibly abundant and doing the job of both pollinating and, and nectaring that uh, she also does a little bit of. Now, the carpenter bee, this is Alicopa, uh, the California carpenter bee, Californica, Arizona. This bee is a species that nests in wood. They're solitary bees like most of the native, most, most of the more than 350 native bees in the Grand Canyon region. She nests in wood by, by eating, eating a, a tube into, into wood and then going out and gathering pollen, putting the pollen into, the, in, into a cell in the tube, sealing that cell, and then creating another cell in front of it. Another one and another one. I've illustrated those from a uh, black and white photograph of, of a cross section of one of those cells. So um, this is, you know, it's, it's a stacked column of, of uh, larvae that are feeding on the pollen that she's, she's placed in there. But here's the problem. She's laid the, 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 the larva that's deepest into the cell first. So that one's gonna mature first and were it to em emerge, it would wipe out all the, all the other progeny in the, in the chamber. Well, that's not, wouldn't be very desirable evolutionarily. And so she is able somehow, uh, and this is being studied by uh, a couple of people in, at the U of A in, in uh, Tucson now, to genetically modify her first offspring to make it develop more slowly. And therefore the eggs that she lays in there produce larvae that emerge sequentially with the, the youngest one emerging first and the oldest one emerging last. Fascinating story. How this is happening, we'll wait to see how that some of that research pays out. Now, this the our, our agaves in Grand Canyon, the Utah century plants, are not pollinated by bats to any great extent. They may do a little bit, but um, uh, more that um, that story is uh, played out with agave, uh, palmeri in, in central and southern Arizona. Uh, Steve Buchan uh, Bookman's uh, uh, illustration there of a, a bat pollinating it is pretty great. The studies that have been done on bat pollination show that bats, uh, that agaves are not really that much better off by being pollinated by bats as opposed to being pollinated by insects. So that they do is great for the bat, but um, it doesn't really matter that much to the, to the agave plants. Um, but uh, nonetheless, bats are, bats are playing a big role in our environment that we typically don't know very much about. One other detail, the agaves have been studied uh, pretty closely in terms of pollination uh, acceptance. The female portion of the plant accepts male, uh, the pollen, which is a male, the male function of the plant, but agaves, uh, uh, the female portions of agaves will not, will not accept males that are either too close or too far away. So in other words, the two, the, those that are too close are probably, you know, the seed set from the, from the previous generation and they're probably pretty closely related. Those that are too far away are foreigners. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the agave does not accept pollinators, but the, pollen, the pollen from, from these distant plants. The wonderful studies have been done um, on many species to, to demonstrate this, but um, the, the interesting part of it is that, uh, that the plant is selecting pollen that will 
uh, that will, it will allow to produce its seed from certain distances, 100 meters, 200 meters, but not from long distance, not so much from long distances and not so much from, from uh, very short distances. So, you know, how, how do plants think? We don't have any clue, but uh, these mechanisms are, are built into the pollen, um, uh, the pollen reception process in agaves and quite interesting that uh, we have this selectivity of pollen acceptance. All right, so that's about the pollination. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of, of uh, organisms that, um, that also are associated with the plant that we, we don't typically recognize. Grand Canyon has an endemic uh, giant agave skipper, uh, Agathemus aliae, aliae uh, found mostly in the Eastern Basin. I haven't seen it in the Western Basin. Uh, there may be another sub, uh, subspecies of this moth, of this butterfly there. These are skippers, which are a group of uh, Lepidoptera between butterflies and moths, but they're closer to butterflies having capitate antennae. The female lays her egg inside the, uh, in the, uh, the, the leaf of, of agave. So these are plants that are living in desert conditions. Sometimes the temperatures will exceed 110 degrees Fahrenheit, sometimes 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The plant does have its own air conditioning system. So it might only get to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but remember the larva is living in this ooze of soap that is dreadfully uh, toxic. So uh, the larva somehow manages to survive inside the inside the leaf, emerges, drops to the ground and pupates, and then these moths fly, these uh, butterflies fly in the summer months, in August. Any, anyone who's hiked in August up on the Tonto platform has probably been passed by these. They're, they're very fast flyers, very difficult to catch, but quite remarkable, quite remarkable big skipper butterflies. So uh, this is one species that actually lives in the plant. All right, so the, the, the lifestyle of the plant is it, uh, it, the seed germinates. The seeds live for about up to several years, but not for, uh, not for decades. So they, don't, they're, they're, they are persistent in the, in, the, uh, in the soil, but not forever. Uh, they germinate, develop into a rosette of uh, spiny thorns, developing their, their, their toxins and whatnot. The plants then get ready to germinate. They may live for eight, uh, perhaps 30 years. And that last year, and this seems to be, to me, it seems to be triggered by whether or not the previous year's monsoon was a good monsoon. Not so much by winter rain, but whether the summer monsoon was a, was a, a good monsoon. So this year, having good monsoons uh, uh, last summer, I would expect to be a pretty good year for flowering agaves in Grand Canyon. As the plant uh, makes its decision to bloom, remember this is a pretty, this is it for the plant. These are monocarpic plants. This is their one opportunity to reproduce. The inner leaves uh, begin to uh, whorl and a finer leaf shape takes place. And then from that, you know, in the springtime, the sometimes four meter tall agave inflorescence will emerge. It's pollinated, the, the seeds develop in pods, as we said. And uh, then as the wind comes along and the pods dry out, the seed, seeds kind of shake to the ground and, and fall around the foot of the plant. So that's the life cycle of uh, these agaves. One other kind of uh, story that's related here is, so yes, there are, are at least one, one butterfly that lives in the, in the leaves of the developing plant uh, of, the, of the rosette, but there's another uh, critter that begins to attack the plant as it's blooming. And this is, uh, the Cyphophorus agave weevil. These are great big. This is our largest weevil in the in the Southwest. Uh, as the plant is flowering, the um, nutrients and toxins uh, shoot upward into the into the stalk to protect the to protect the fruit developing fruits and uh, and seeds. But this leaves the basal rosette unprotected and vulnerable to insect attack, and uh, quite a large number of flies and. And, um, and weevils and some other critters begin to eat this rich food source that's been uh, sitting there for so long. Gwen Waring did her uh, work on agave palm rye and identified about 35 different species of insects that are, uh, that are uh, in and on the plant, of which many are herbivores and attack the plant at this, at this crucial stage of its production. So as that stalk is emerging up out of the, uh, out of the rosette, the rosette is dying. The stalk dies actually fairly quickly as well. The flowers, uh, are pollinated, the, the, fr the fruits develop, and then they dry and harden, and the, the seeds shake out of them. But this is a great big weevil that we have 
pretty commonly in Grand Canyon. It's, it's not too uncommon to, to find it if you look around the agave plants uh, after they've begun to flower. All right, so we talked about Eastern Basin Kaibab agave and the Western Basin uh, agave that, that creates multiple pups or basal, uh, uh, you know, complex basal rosettes. The Eastern one, which produces only a single rosette, blooms after say 25 years or something and dies is uh, monocarpic. One, one reproductive event in its life. Everything goes into that, uh, uh, that it's got goes into that reproductive event. In the Western Canyon, this uh, Utah variety is the dominant one. You can't find any of the, uh, really any of the kaibab plants in, in the Western portion of the, of the canyon. These might have dozens of, uh, as I said, dozens of rosettes associated with them. Any individual rosette may bloom and die on a good year, but the overall individual here lives, we, we don't know how long. Again, if I, I've seen uh, uh, fairy rings with thousands of rosettes, those plants could be 5,000 years old or more. So very, very different uh, change in lifestyle. Now, what we don't know about these two varieties is whether they actually hybridize or actually can, can, uh, can produce viable offspring. If they don't, of course, then they would be regarded as separate species. And if that's the case, that's the case, but they are certainly closely related. Uh, the interesting part of this story to me is that the Western form is basically um, eternal in life. And this, this transition happens oddly from river to rim at between mile 110, one, uh, 100 and 110, if you're going down, down on a river trip. So uh, 12 miles below Phantom Ranch, you see this shift into the polycarpic form. And by the time you get down to say to Pete's Creek or something, all the plants are polycarpic that you, that you encounter. Very rarely do you find anything that's uh, monocarpic and it's, <clears throat> made to, it's just very unlikely to find them. So uh, this polycarpic form completely takes over the landscape, right at what's called uh, the Grand Scenic Divide uh, comes up from from Bass Point. There, um, that Grand Scenic Divide is the place where the where the Tano platform dwindles out and the Supai platform dwindles in as uh, kind of major landform features of Grand Canyon. But the, again, this is just quite a puzzle. Uh, from river to rim, uh, you, we find this transition right in that zone. Now, you would think if um, because pupping is something you would, uh, that the people have associated with more stressful environments. You, and because elevation determines climate, you would think this would be a gradual transition across elevation, but it's not. It's really a fairly abrupt uh, uh, biological boundary. So um, this is quite a puzzle. This is uh, an unresolved puzzle. And uh, it's uh, quite clear from the mapping that these, um, even though the Utah variety has been found upstream in a few places, um, the Kaibab variety is really pretty much restricted to that, uh, to the, to the Eastern Canyon. So, uh, and, and uh, this is right along the axis of what's called the Grand Scenic Divide. 90% of the plants in the upper base, in the upper Eastern Basin are, are uh, Kaibab variety, more than 90% uh, in the, in the Western Basin are the Utah variety. Uh, the difference here is that the uh, rainfall is quite uh, a bit different in these two basins. Eastern Grand Canyon, uh, Lee's Ferry to, to uh, Crystal Rapid and down, down to uh, Kanab Creek gets about 100 to 200 millimeters of rain a year, five to eight uh, inches of rain per year on average. It's also a, a landscape with uh, relatively few bighorn compared to the Western Canyon. Bighorn populations are much more abundant in the, in the Western Canyon. In contrast, the, the Western Basin has about half that amount of rainfall. It has hotter summers and uh, quite, a, quite a few more bighorn in the picture. So it may be that the temperature, uh, the, the climate difference is, is driving some of this story, but it can also be that herbivores might be driving part of the story. It's very common to see uh, uh, developing agave stems that are chewed off. The plant desperately tries to put out a little, a little more uh, reproductive growth, but uh, it's all in vain. Uh, once the stalk is chewed off, it's, uh, it's lost. It can't, it can't uh, reproduce. So bighorn sheep and pack rats uh, and other rodents are, are uh, the dominant herbivores on these stems. And uh, from what I can tell in, in doing quite a few measurements here, it's about twice as much herbivory attack going on on the, on the developing inflorescences in the Western Canyon as compared to the Eastern Canyon. So that's, that's um, you know, a really intriguing story. It was something we didn't really know about Grand Canyon 
is that the, the level of climate difference, eastern and western canyon, is, uh, is capable perhaps of, of, uh, of driving big changes in, in uh, basic biology. A, a life stage going from monocarpic to polycarpic. And even if these are different species, it's monocarpic to polycarpic across that boundary for the same lifestyle. Uh, that uh, the Western Canyon is uh, considerably more harsh than, than the Eastern Canyon. All right, so we've talked about Utah agave, two varieties there of the four that exist in the, uh, in the Southwest. Let's look at another peculiar agave in Grand Canyon. This one is, uh, is the Grand Canyon agave, agave philipsiana. This is a species that was discovered maybe 30 or 40 years ago, but uh, only recently described, relatively recently described. There are only four populations and they're very tiny populations. This one in Deer Creek, whatever it was, six or eight years ago, uh, reproduced, which was quite an exciting event because uh, otherwise we hadn't seen any reproduction in this thing. There's also a, uh, one population down near Sedona. So the range of this plant is mostly Grand Canyon, three or four populations at Grand Canyon, one in Sedona, and that's it. This is a plant though that uh, uh, probably has a long association with humans and may have actually been brought in by humans to the, to the landscape or, or somehow manipulated back in the, in the uh, prehistoric times. Native Americans greatly relied on, on agave. Uh, we've seen rock shelter piles of what are called quids. If you, when you bake an agave uh, root mass, uh, it kind of looks like a huge artichoke and those quids are are plant starch that can be carried around and, and eaten at the individual's convenience. And um, so if, if you're stuck in a, a cave in Grand Canyon for the winter, then you might have a pretty good food source over the course of the winter. Yeah, sometimes I've, I've seen quid piles that are in excess of a meter, meter deep. So uh, kind of the middens of these, of these um, long eating uh, times. So not only do we have filled Philipsiana, uh, quite a rare plant there. We have uh, two other agaves that show up. One is agave perii, which is uh, uh, just one or just very few records on that in Grand Canyon, but it's very widespread along the Mugion Rim and farther to the south. If you happen to hike up on Mount Eldon on the south facing slopes there, you, you commonly find this plant. It's also found up on Government Mountain, a po small population up there. But this is a very different agave, shorter leaves, very broad leaves, it's reaching its north, the northern limit of its range in Flagstaff and, and just near the southern side of Grand Canyon. There's one record, there's also one record of agave shoddy eye. It's called shin diggers. Uh, uh, one record from Deer Creek, I haven't actually looked at the specimen, so I, I'm, I'm not entirely positive. I'm, I'm not confident that this is what it is, but other botanists say that it, that's a valid specimen. Is that this species doesn't have uh, spines on the on the edge, and therefore it can get pretty easily confused with banana yucca. But that's there's a record for agave shoddy eye in, in Deer Creek as well. So these are the agaves of, of Grand Canyon. As I said, this is a really important plant for Native Americans. Uh, the fibers were used, uh, it has been used to make paper. And at every large canyon juncture with the Colorado River, uh, both along the, uh, in many cases along the river, uh, often up on the tunnel platform, and uh, even pretty high up, like here along the Bright Angel Trail at the top of the Red Wall, uh, there are roasting pits. These are 10 to 15 meters in diameter, places where the uh, Native Americans would gather uh, all kinds of things uh, to bake uh, to bake in the earth. Agaves take about three days really to, to uh, cook to a point to the point where the saponins have been de degraded uh, and where they can be eaten. Wendy Hodgson has, has held a couple of agave roasts around gathering uh, agaves from different populations. One was held in the in the Verde Valley that I attended and she had maybe eight or ten different agaves that uh, uh, had been harvested and brought in for the for the roasting pit. These are incredibly tasty plants when you eat them. So it must have been a real treat for the Native Americans to to, to be able to have these um, this food source to be able to work with. What really impressed me most was the variety of tastes that the different populations and species put forth. Uh, have the tastes range from potato to sweet potato all the way to pineapple. It's really an incredible array of tastes and, and uh, have no doubt that uh, if one were to really focus on, uh, on regularly harvest these things as Native Americans 
undoubtedly did, they would be very particular about which populations they'd be harvesting and placing in these roasting pits to, to, uh, to roast. But the roasting pits are a very common archeological feature all throughout Grand Canyon uh, along the river. And, and in some places, the roast, there are roasting pits where there are no populations of agave left uh, down in the lower canyon, especially in some, some areas uh, around mile 200 there. Very hard to find any agaves whatsoever. They might've been harvested to extinction uh, in those uh, prehistoric times. Today, agave is produced widely in Mexico, uh, this is the blue agave, agave tequiliana, which is obviously produced for uh, the beverage and also for other things, uh, agave nectar. Uh, agaves are propagated, raised up for a number of years. Uh, the, the mature plants are then, uh, before they bloom, are, are harvested. The root mass is pulled out and, uh, and they're shipped off to be prepared. There are uh, half a dozen steps in how uh, tequila, for example, and agave nectar uh, are also are produced. The, the plants are harvested. They are baked for, again, for quite a prolonged period of time. Uh, then they're shredded to extract the juice, and that's how the nectar, uh, agave nectar is made. But for tequila, the mosto is fermented and, uh, and distilled and aged. And um, <clears throat> so, there's quite a, um, uh, you know, an avid market for tequila and for agave nectar as well now. Uh, but tequila consumption in, the, in 2020 in the U.S. was 193.5 million liters, 51 million gallons of, of tequila was consumed just in the U.S. And some of the finer agaves, the Silver Patron, for example, $64 a liter at la when last I checked. So that's a huge industry. In contrast, the blue agave nectar is about uh, a tenth of that cost, but, uh, um, but it's also become gaining greatly in popularity. It's, it's certainly very delicious. The problem is agaves are difficult to raise. They're often raised in, uh, as uh, kind of boundaries between fields, uh, interspace between fields, and the crop is kind of unreliable. So the harvesters are always a little bit uncertain as to what they're going to be able to harvest. The tequila producers are uh, uncertain as to what they're going to be able, be able to get to harvest to produce their, their uh, product. And therefore, there's a lot of tension in this industry. Interesting the way that um, this has played out sociologically from being a, a, a quite essential substance food for Native Americans a thousand years ago to having this pretty contentious industry going on. So oftentimes, agaves are are poached. In some, in some cases, we're uh, facing some conservation challenges. We had a threatened Arizona agave, but it, that turned out to be a, a hybrid species, and the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does not recognize hybrids as being as being endangered. But it's still an extremely rare population of these things we've got in Central Arizona. But in contrast, the agave aurea in Baja California and some other agaves down there are actively harvested and or poached, and uh, and it's difficult to find any reproduction going on in in uh, in, in some of those populations. And some other local populations have been eliminated by, by habitat loss and other, and other factors. So agave is a very interesting plant, biologically and, and, uh, and sociologically. Uh, and there are some conservation challenges that, that face the, the population, these populations. So today we've talked about this pretty complex physiology and life history, comparing the Utahensis varieties, showing that we have interbasin climate and herbivore intensity differences uh, in Grand Canyon between the eastern and western basins. There are now very intensive and, uh, and somewhat competing human interests, whether nectar production and tequila production can actually uh, coexist uh, economically will be quite interesting to keep track of. And we have some populations that are rare and, and face conservation challenges, including climate change. Fascinating plants, one of probably close to 2,500 species in the overall region, uh, one of 1,800 species in Grand Canyon, National Park, and, and each species, of course, has its own set of stories. Agaves are quite a kind of glorious and intricate story there, but every every species has its own wonderful story to tell. If we can focus in and, and learn about them, there's a rich world of natural legacy and natural uh, natural heritage right, right under our feet. It seems that the flower stalk grows inches a day. Is that correct? Yes, perhaps a foot a day, rivaling the fastest plant growth that we, we know of. Yeah. Um, oh, do some have seeds and pups? Somebody asked. Many species. So the, the pup forming agaves, of which there are quite a few species, uh, these are clonal species. And so the, the pups are connected, all connected to each other. It's one 
what we call a genet, uh, a, a genetic individual. But uh, any one of the individual pups can produce an inflorescence and a flower and produce seed and, uh, and then die. But the overall genetic individual in those pup forming populations and species do not die, if that makes sense. So the individual stays al can stay alive for you know, potentially hundreds of years or even thousands of years. Um, however, the individual rosette, uh, pup rosette will live its lifespan out uh, in a matter of a decade or so. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm.